Heart rate variability is a proxy to the parasympathetic branch of the autonomic nervous system. We can try to capture uh, these variations in uh, stress and recovery by using heart rate variability as a proxy to parasympathetic activity. We want our body to be adaptive, right? To um, adapt well to different situations. And if uh, our uh, heart was beating always exactly the same, we would not be able to adapt to any situation because it would be always constant. Mm -hmm. So that probably can give a better understanding of why we uh, want higher heart rate variability. It means that the body is more adaptive and then you can you know, take up uh, different challenges better. Well, Marco Altini, thanks for being on High Intensity Health. It's great Thank to be with you. you. For having me. Yeah, my pleasure. So a mutual friend of ours, Alessandro Ferretti, that's how we know each other, and he recommended your app, HRV4 Training, which if folks don't know about it, they definitely want to check it out. Mm -hmm. It's an awesome app. So we'll have a link below this video where they can Thank just you. go in the app store and stuff. But I really wanted to you know, meet with you and kind of chat with you about heart rate variability in terms of athleticism. You know, there's mm -hmm. the inner balance with HeartMath, the HeartMath Institute. Yeah. A lot of people are familiar with that. But I like your app, how it's you know, just use your finger around your iPhone and to test you know, heart rate variability. But let's kind of talk about what heart rate variability is. If people aren't really familiar with the mm -hmm. term, can you kind of define it a little bit? Yeah, yeah, sure. So heart rate variability basically is a concept that your heart does not beat at a constant frequency, but there is always small variations between beats. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, what we do when we measure heart rate variability is trying to quantify these small variations. Uh, which you can quantify in many different ways. So um, typically we use uh, time domain measures, which are rather simple to compute and uh, help also consistency and uh, let's say even comparing different studies because it's quite standard how we compute these measures with respect to, for example, other more complex frequency domain features, which uh, are less standardized. So that's something we do. Mm -hmm. um, so the idea of measuring heart rate variability starts from the fact that, um, let's say many body functions are governed by the autonomic nervous system, which is constituted by two branches. So the sympathetic and the parasympathetic one. Uh, and basically as um, we are interested in uh, trying to capture certain aspects related to physiological stress and condition, especially of recovery and rest. Um, as heart rate variability is a proxy to the parasympathetic branch of the autonomic nervous system, we can try to capture uh, these variations in uh, stress and recovery by using heart rate variability as a proxy to parasympathetic activity. Mm -hmm. So these time domain measures that we use, uh, which analyze these small variations in consecutive bits that uh, we were talking about before, uh, basically give us good insights on parasympathetic activity in particular. So while we have these two branches um, and some research uh, try to quantify both and to understand also uh, how to quantify better the sympathetic branch. Mm. It seems that from more, uh, let's say more consistent findings that the only thing we can actually measure uh, with decent accuracy is parasympathetic activity, in particular uh, increases or reductions in parasympathetic activity, which do not necessarily mean that we can uh, make inferences on what is happening on the other branch, as the two things are not exactly complementary. Mm. Uh, but still, especially in the context of stress and recovery, um, as the parasympathetic branch is the one in charge of, uh, let's say, resting functions of the body, and most of what happens unconsciously and as well as, you know, just simply uh, your body rest conditions, we can get a decent grasp of uh, how that part of your body is doing by measuring heart rate variability. Mm -hmm. So just to summarize real quick, we want a higher beat to beat variability, so a higher heart HRV, and that kind of quantifies the activity or the degree to which the parasympathetic nervous system is turned on. Yes, okay. so I think sometimes this is not very intuitive that we want to have, you know, a heart which is not like a clock, but it yeah. like there is much variability between beats. Uh, the reason is that, um, so we can think it this way, like if we, we want our body to be adaptive, right, mm. to um, adapt well to different situations, and if uh, our uh, heart was beating always exactly the same, 
we would not be able to adapt to any situations because it would be always constant. Mm -hmm. So that probably can give a better understanding of why we uh, want higher variability uh, mostly, and that's because simply you know the body means it means that the body is more adaptive, and then you can you know take up uh, different challenges better. Mm -hmm. And so one of the terms that's used frequently is resilience. Mm -hmm. People talk about like coherence and resilience. So our body is more resilient and kind of. Tougher is that kind of a, a loose word, loose way to describe it? Yeah, I would say yeah. so. I mean, it's uh, is yeah. I, I like to say to use adaptive more, mm -hmm. but it's uh, I would say the similar concept. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And then so heart rate variability, as, as I understand it, is being researched in athleticism and exercise physiology quite heavily. I have my RSS feed for uh, PubMed and Google Scholar. Yeah. I have the updates, so I get pinged all the time about mm -hmm. new papers, and we'll talk about your paper. But let's talk about why athletes or a weekend warrior, someone who just wants mm -hmm. to maintain body composition, is tracking HRV good to kind of see how their body is yeah. adapting? As uh, we measure physiological stress, and physiological stress is affected by basically anything that happens to us. Uh, HRV is affected not only by training, of course, but also by you know life stress and uh, what whatever other condition um, you know happens in our life. However, since training is such a big stressor, typically, especially if you're an athlete, but also in the case of weekend warriors or uh, people that have more regular lifestyle, but um, let's say work out regularly, uh, that's one of the applications where we've seen, uh, let's say, more research because it's, uh, I would say, it's easier to capture variations in uh, HRV due to training. And even before HRV was used that much, uh, I'd say it was um, physiological changes still were used. For example, simply heart rate at rest was one of the old metrics that um, athletes would use to understand how much they recovered. They would expect maybe a higher heart rate on the day following an intense training. Um, with HRV, it's a similar situation, but basically we are a bit more sensitive to these changes. Mm -hmm. So while heart rate would change maybe by half a bit or a bit, which is very little and might be due to other reasons. Typically we see bigger changes in HRV, which make it easier to quantify um, the, the intensity basically of, of the previous workouts. So by measuring HRV, you can try to understand uh, if you recovered from the previous trainings. Uh, let's say on a day-to-day -day basis, you can get some insights that will help you adjust your training plans. But also in the long term, then you can see, um, let's say, your trends and uh, how the overall situation is going. Because, um, let's say, it's important try to try also to move beyond the day-to-day -day variations uh, and the small adjustments to understand better uh, how your overall training plan and program is impacting your physical conditions. So that's also something you can st start looking at by look when, when you accumulate more data, let's say. Mm, that's really fascinating. As we we're talking offline, I used to do a lot of bike racing competitively, yeah. and so the first thing I would do in the morning is use my polar heart rate monitor. Mm -hmm. This was like in 2005 and 2009, mm -hmm. and I do remember the heart, my pulse would vary so much. And so you talked about things, you know, just in that last segment, it, it's much more variable mm -hmm. um, than HRV. So things like dehydration, alcohol mm -hmm. use. Um, those are other parameters that you would look at. So it kind of confuses yeah. you know, the picture. Am I overtraining? Am I undertraining? Mm -hmm. Am I arrested or not? Whereas if we can just summarize what you're saying right there, HIV, HRV monitoring is much more sensitive and specific. Right? Well, um, I would say it is more sensitive, but at the same time also to the other parameters. So mm -hmm. it's not that easy. Yeah. yeah. So it makes everything more challenging, I would say. Mm. But I think one of the big advantages we have now is that you can uh, measure in a much simpler way. So you can gather more data. So like with the apps like HRV for training, you can measure at home um, just using the phone so you don't need to wear the sensor. Um, you can measure easily every day for a longer period of time. And we started also incorporating more information so you can uh, add all this extra context that you didn't have before, uh, which it's key to understand how things are changing, even just how while you are sleeping, or uh, alcohol intake the previous night, or um, all other parameters. Mental that, energy, I like that. Well. Yeah. <laughs> because sometimes after a long training day, you wake up and you're like, you can tell that you're a little cloudy, a little mm -hmm. fuzzy, operating a little bit slower. Yeah, yeah, exactly. As well as traveling or, um, you know, even just being sick. Like if you just gather data for 
for a long period of time and you don't have all this contextual information, then there is little you can do because it, then it's just guesswork and you try to figure out what is happening. But as we gather all these data points and all this contextual information, then we can have more systematic analysis of what is happening. So things we do in the app, for example, we have this insights section where uh, we can look at these day-to-day -day changes. So we look at many different things, but one of the insights is acute HRV changes, which means that uh, what, we can, what we call acute changes is the day-to-day -day variation. So today I did this workout and the following day my HRV reduced by that or not. Okay, so we try to move from you know anecdotes and this day I did that and this happened to looking at the past two or three months systematically what happened under these conditions, how your physiology changed so that you can understand better what is impacting your physiology and learn from that. Mm, that's beautiful. I noticed travel and alcohol are, are two things in addition to yeah. extensive training mm -hmm. that lead to a lot of the day-to-day -day variation. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Let, let's kind of talk about a little bit, back up a little bit for someone that's just now getting into this. Why first thing in the morning mm -hmm. and then also if they are using other apps like the inner balance just to to mm -hmm. train their brain to be in a more yeah. parasympathetic state um, how does training like post-workout is our heart rate variability increased or decreased mm -hmm. um, yeah, kind okay of so up. regarding the the measurement mm -hmm. let's say first thing in the morning is because uh, we want to try to make sure that there is no other stressors while we measure so we need to make this simple but also closer to what we do in the lab mm. for example in a study you would normally go to the lab um, after i don't know two hours that you've eaten or uh, at, with your body arrested then you would lie on a bed for like half an hour to you know be sure that you are again completely rested and you can take your measurement so as a matter of fact maybe it's even better to do it outside of the lab if you can do it at home and you can avoid all these steps and mm -hmm. also people you know would eat different things which also would influence your physiology so we just really try to make it very simple and easy to reproduce and to have your body in complete rest state which is not affected by many other different parameters um, so that's the consistent condition within this uh, condition we also need to take care of a few other things that would affect your heart rate variability as almost everything affects it, as we were saying before. So for example, breathing. Uh, it's fine to have uh, breathing self-paced. We provide a guide in there simply because um, by deep breathing, you would increase your heart rate variability, which is, for example, the principle that is used uh, by others like heart math or um, in the context of biofeedback and meditation training and these kind of things. Uh, so by deep breathing, then you would, um, let's say, increase the swing between uh, beats, one breathing in and out, uh, and you would increase your active variability. And I think people will understand that after a, a while. And you would, you know, uh, try to get higher scores, maybe just Artificially by... Artificially Yeah, almost. exactly. Yeah. So you could trick yourself and that's why we say, okay, you can totally do it uh, self-paced because that's also what they do in many studies. But what they do in these studies typically they measure a person only once. Mm -hmm. So there is never a very bit re repeatability issue, right? Yeah. While when you start doing every day, then you figure it out. So it's better if you just have a control mechanism that avoids that. That's yeah. one of the main reasons why I, I keep pushing for the paced breathing, not that because I think it's much better than the other one, but it's just because you need to be consistent. Right. And the same is also for body position. So for, oh. uh, let's say for athletes that might have a very low heart rate, um, sometimes they say, okay, it's better if you sit or uh, stand up because you introduce that little extra stressor on your body, mm. uh, which is better because otherwise you could end up in these situations in which they say you would uh, saturate your HRV because simply your heart rate is very low. And then uh, for certain individuals, it might be better than to sit or stand if you have a very low heart rate. But uh, in general, I think for like a really broad um, set of individuals, uh, there's no problem. So you can just lie down in bed and take your measurement always in the same body position. Um, breathing rate constant and, uh, you know, not checking your email mm -hmm. before. <laughs> well, everything that can get you stressed, like not, don't do that because it would influence your physiology super quickly. Yeah. Because it, it takes really nothing to reduce your HRV. Also coming back to training and post-training, 
as you would introduce much stress on your body, um, your HRV after training is mo most likely very low. Mm. During training is probably close to zero as it makes almost no sense to looking at variations during training. Although there is some research where they try to look at um, lactate threshold, for example, but that's only during maximal tests. So if you just go for a workout, looking at HRV mm. right now it doesn't seem it's going to tell you much. Um, with respect to what heart rate already tells you. Uh, so after a workout, you would have a much lower HRV due to the, the intensity of the workout and the stress you put on your body. And as a matter of fact, that's also what we measure the morning after because that stress lasts for maybe 24, 48 hours. Mm. And that's what you try to capture when you, the day after, try to see if you have recovered. Um, so I would, I would say also the time of the day you work out will have an influence on this because if you work out in the morning, you have more time to recover before the morning after, obviously. While if you work out in the evening at the same intensity, probably you had less time. That's an awesome tip, Marco, being consistent like that. So one of the things that I have my wife do, we just both lie in bed and we have our fingers down. We do two minutes on the HRV4 mm -hmm. training app. That's a good know, idea. Yeah. To do a little Actually, bit longer, Yeah, I so I think there's also variability between consecutive measures, right? Yeah. So because your body is never in the exact same state. Mm -hmm. uh, so while things will not swing too much, and still you will be within what are your normal values. If you record for a bit longer, I think in general it's a good idea. Yeah. As a matter of fact, when they do studies, they record for five minutes, mm -hmm. which is already considered a short measurement. Mm -hmm. So there's been different studies showing that 60 seconds is good enough to capture um, your median HRV in that period, but there is also no mm -hmm. doubt that a shorter measurement is more affected by repeatability issues. So mm. it's a good idea, I think, to take yeah. it for two minutes. Yeah. yeah, go a little longer. So I'd like to meditate first thing in the morning, but I do the test first, the HRV4 mm -hmm. training app, to get my baseline. Then that will uh, you know, kind of help me set the tone for the day. If it's really mm -hmm. low, then I know I need to take it easy and, mm -hmm. and work on that. But it's a good practice because we were talking offline how our, the natural tendency in 21st century is to get on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter and kind of yeah. check your stats and kind of mm -hmm. touch base with the world as it is. But that, in my opinion, immediately sends, me, sends my HRV down, right? Mm -hmm. So it's good to get the baseline as, as a reminder to not do that until later in the yeah. day. Yeah, it uh, gets me stressed as well. Yeah. <laughs> like, I remember right. one of the lowest scores I got was um, when the time zone changed here because mm. I had a bug in the app that yeah. basically didn't work anymore in certain countries. Yeah. So I checked like my phone and <laughs> like a million notifications of yeah. everyone complaining. Yeah. And that of course killed my score for yeah. that day, <laughs> even though in my country worked. Yeah, yeah. oh mm. my goodness. That's, well, hopefully you got the bug worked out. Yeah, I appreciate everything it. fine now. <laughs> yeah, the app runs flawless. I mean, I really like Thank the you. app. You did a great mm -hmm. job with the interface Thanks. and the user ability and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So let's kind of talk about some things. I've been experimenting with this, right? And I noticed some fluctuations after intense training days and Alessandro, our mutual friend and the reason why mm -hmm. we know each other now is uh, like he called it like parasympathetic compensation. Mm -hmm. So after, interestingly, I did like, like really intense hike and some other uh, hard training days, my HRV like spiked and I was like, oh, that's mm -hmm. really good, but maybe it's like a compensatory mechanism. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that? Yeah, so uh, the way I look at this, I would say is more uh, from a statistical point of view. Uh, like as my background is not actually in physiology, mm -hmm. but um, so the point being that, yeah, in certain situations, especially when you might be stressing your body too much, there might be other mechanisms that also play a role. Uh, and the way we translate this in the app is to look at basically what is uh, your normal range of values, right? So we just changed also a couple of things where we now look at a broader um, time period. So we look, for example, at the past two months and we look at how your uh, HRV changed like day to day in this time period and try to capture then what are your normal values and when you deviate from that then we start to look at other parameters as well. So um, for example some days your heart your heart rate variability is much higher than your normal like you were saying before but it could be that that's totally fine it's not um, mm. it's not a red flag and some other days might be a red flag. Okay? So the way we look at that then is also to factor in other parameters, for example, how your recent trends are going. Um, 
subjective data as well. We started including because obviously there is uh, there are things that HRV cannot capture, even for example uh, muscle pain for mm -hmm. people that uh, I don't know do triathlon or um, that have a very high uh, training loads. Mm -hmm. Um, there is some, uh, we, we can measure what is the effort on the cardiac system, but not on the muscles. So we now try to factor in multiple parameters so that when we have something which is, uh, let's say, abnormal or it's simply, you know, by definition outside of your normal values, mm -hmm. um, we can try to provide also better advice on that and let's say move on from higher is better, which is clearly not always the case. Mm -hmm. mm. Interesting. What are some of the what I've noticed in the in the trends, kind of the standard deviation, if you will, of like untrained versus trained, and what we see is there's greater heart rate variability in trained athletes compared to like the general mm -hmm. population. Can you talk about what that is? Is HRV an adaptation to exercise that our body naturally? So um, I think also on this aspect, there is some controversy. Maybe mm -hmm. uh, let's say that uh, people tried also to uh, relate HRV to fitness or. Uh, for example, to estimate uh, uh, maximal cardiac output using HRV without much success. Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, using other measures, for example, uh, simply heart rate provided better results. Hmm. Uh, also because there, there is maybe a clear link, say, you know, you work out and your heart muscle gets better and you can pump, you know, uh, more blood mm -hmm. with each cycle and your heart rate lowers. And then in general, lower heart rate is related to much higher fitness. Okay, so that's, let's say, a stronger link, which is also why we have all these uh, sub-maximal fitness tests where you would go to the gym and do a very specific exercise like you bike at a certain intensity mm -hmm. and then uh, they measure your heart rate and then basically the lowest it is that is this standard intensity and then the more fit you are right? right so that's quite a clear link but with hrv it's a bit different also it seems that there is very strong genetic components mm -hmm. um, so um, in my data for example what i see is that there are changes uh, on a daily basis and also on cycles let's say over a year in which i am more or less stressed but eventually, that's my baseline. Even when I train very well, uh, for what is what my body can take, yeah. still um, the, it, it, the HRV is not going to be much higher than what is my normal. Hmm. Because maybe that is simply what is your number, let's say, yeah. due to genetic and other reasons. And then that's also what makes it a good marker of recovery more than fitness, I would say, mm. and of, uh, in general, physiological stress. Because you see how all these parameters affect your body um, and uh, yeah, not necessarily, I would say, relating it to, um, to fitness. Mm -hmm. So it's really mm. interesting that there may be some predetermined genetic baseline for our HRV. Yeah, I would say so. So I yeah. think at the cross-sectional level, we saw typically that, yes, more fit people tend to have higher HRV. Mm -hmm. But we've seen also triathletes with like what we would call lower values and still they can take up much training and perform very well and still use the data as a measure of recovery, uh, but not necessarily as a measure of fitness. Interesting. I have a couple of questions on that, but I want to finish up for, for people that are not currently training and if they're just to motivate them to start mm -hmm. measuring their HRV. There's a lot of data when I first got into this in 2010, yeah. first got into HRV assessment, that is, mm -hmm. 2010 through the heart math. Um, All-cause mortality, heart disease, yep. neurocognitive impairment. I mean, there's a lot of chronic diseases that mm -hmm. are linked with low heart rate variability. Mm -hmm. Do you have any feedback or thoughts on, on that? So I think uh, that's also in general what we see uh, similarly with heart rate at rest. Uh, I would say again that maybe heart rate at rest is a better marker and one you can more easily control. I would also say, um, like bef before I was mentioning, maybe it's harder to change what is your your baseline HRV. Uh, that is typically the case if you have uh, already an active lifestyle, let's say, which is also what happens in uh, almost all the user base of HRV for training because these people that are interested in typically monitoring their training. Uh, however, if you are an inactive person, when you do that switch between being inactive and active, that's also where you might see more of these changes. Mm. So it's been shown in studies that inactive people that start doing exercise uh, typically show also an increase in HRV because um, 
Yeah, you know, when you when you do that switch between inactivity and activity, yeah. there is a bigger jump than maybe when you add that 10, 20 percent more to someone that is already active. Right. So I would say in general, yeah, there can be still a, um, room for changes. Yeah. It's not that you're doomed to what you get the first <laughs> right. measure, right? Yeah. But uh, at the same time, also it depends on other factors and lifestyle and what you're already used to do or not. Yeah, yeah, I love that. Let's kind of finish off with some of the factors. I, w I would like to talk about training and which training you see all the changes in. But first, what comes to mind is diet and nutrition. And one mm -hmm. of the things that our mutual friend Alessandro was talking about, and this is what really intrigued me when I met him over a year ago, was how ketogenic diets increase heart rate variability. Mm -hmm. And I was really intrigued by that. So. Um, have you t spoken with him or, or other people using the app about diet and links between? So uh, yeah, honestly, I don't know much about mm -hmm. the topic. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> yeah. Well, for folks listening, if they want to learn more about that, Alessandro and I recorded yeah. a, a great episode about a year ago, and we we dove into that. So that was one of the things that encouraged him to stay with nutritional ketosis mm -hmm. because he okay. found, you know, if it's helping his parasympathetic nervous system, then it must be reducing inflammation. It mm -hmm. might be helping other parameters metabolically that are affecting his, you know, CNS and, and yeah. uh, you know, stress response, which is really cool. Yeah. So let's talk about training modalities. And, uh, you know, so we have a lot of endurance athletes are using the app. You mm -hmm. have weightlifting, CrossFitters, Jiu-Jitsu. I mean, a yeah. lot of people, wh who has the best HRV? Have you found, <laughs> or is that I think in general, what we see is uh, people that practice sports where there is a, a really, uh, big aerobic component right mm. so it's triathletes uh, it's uh, cyclists and runners typically show with them um, with the highest scores and also these are typically the situations in which um, the day-to-day -day changes maybe are more meaningful as they are more representative of um, aerobic workouts and you know the uh, stress on your uh, cardiac system is about that's what you can capture so Something we started looking at is also how these changes are meaningful for people which are not, uh, let's say, the typical runner or cyclist that was uh, part of these studies from which we gathered that uh, heart rate and HRV are good measures of the recovery. So something we can start doing by having an app which is you know released to many and as you say, like everyone does different sports and keeps tracking, then you can start looking and everyone is also reporting all these reference points that we need, like um, what did you do yesterday and mm -hmm. your training, how intense it was. So we started, for example, um, taking data for uh, uh, sports that we classified as aerobic and again uh, cyclists, runners and so. And then we took, uh, let's say, strength and power athletes and people doing um, I don't know, power lifting and all these other sort of sports. Mm -hmm. And then we looked at their day-to-day -day changes with respect to what they reported to see if we could capture well uh, their recovery on the following day in both sports. Uh, so this is a kind of a more exploratory analysis that you can do thanks to the fact that you don't have to rely anymore on 20 people coming to the lab and probably doing the same thing because you hope to see something in some homogeneous sample of the population. Yeah. But you can start, you know, stratifying by all sorts of different parameters because you have many more data points. Um, but yeah, again, also in this context, we could see that for people doing aerobic workouts, uh, the reductions in HRV were more consistent mm. um, and they were sort of linear with the intensity. So the more intense, the more reduction in HRV, while for the other sports, we couldn't see this that clearly. So mm. there was a clear reduction only after uh, trainings that were reported at, uh, as uh, very intense. While for the other ones, we couldn't see much, which makes sense because, you know, you didn't stress your body much, most likely not at all aerobically speaking. And then, um, yeah, probably the variations you see in HRV are due to all the other factors that play a role in your life more than your workout. Interesting. I didn't know this prior to speaking with you, but but my fluctuations in, in HRV first morning have been the greatest after an aerobic workout. Mm -hmm. So it leads me to think like how beneficial aerobic, intense aerobic, even though I love the endorphins, I love getting out in nature, mm -hmm. how beneficial is that for my physiology if I'm thinking like longevity, not necessarily mm -hmm. performance, you know, because with weight training, it's not just cortisol and stress hormones and sympathetic hormones that are 
increase its also growth hormone, testosterone, and mm -hmm. things of the sort. So you wonder like how mm -hmm. catabolic and detrimental mm -hmm. some of these really intense aerobic workouts are if it's like trashing or causing these huge yeah. shifts in your HRV. Yeah. Any feedback there? Yeah, I think, you know, balance is always the key. Yeah. And uh, especially when you try to combine different types of workouts. And also a reduction doesn't necessarily mean uh, something negative. It might be that, you know, you are actually over time improving your mm. body and your cardiac system, but you just need to take some days of rest. That's yeah. what simply uh, the uptake time may be to capture. Mm. So yeah, let's let's get into the fine details just like that. So if your baseline is say 77 or mm -hmm. whatever, like, you know, high, high normal, mm -hmm. and it starts to creep down into the 40s, for example, for a couple of days, what do you do? Some r light days, some yoga, yeah. walking? Yeah, I would say that especially, um, in general, the changes we are more interested in are the reductions. Okay. There is also in some recent studies we saw um, on um, runners. Okay. So instead of using these day-to-day -day variations, they will look at uh, the baseline, so just the baseline. And then when the baseline was below what is your normal values, you would postpone intense training blocks mm. because that's probably not the period in which your body is in the best condition to take a new in intense training block. Yeah, so and why this, push it then? Yeah, exactly. It's so, and then the question was, if we don't push it when you are not in the optimal conditions, would then be optimizing the, the condition in the long run? So they, class they cluster people into groups Mm -hmm. One would postpone the trainings when they were not, let's say, physiologically ready, and the other ones would just follow their training plan. So eventually the ones that had put to postpone the training, they obviously eventually trained as less intensity overall, because they just could not do it always. Mm -hmm. And when they measured their performance in some race event, they actually performed better. Wow. So that's interesting because you would normally say, okay, you need to train it always intensely and you know your body will assimilate and improve however if you do that probably when it's not the right time then it's not going to be beneficial I love so this. yeah that was uh, you know an interesting outcome also because you started looking more at baseline changes and long-term trends not only at these day-to-day changes where we have much variability so something that is uh, you know maybe even easier to apply as we look at uh, baseline trends. This is huge because for any athlete, you know, the worst thing you can get is an injury, right? Mm -hmm. And so do you see that people injure themselves when they are training when they probably shouldn't be based upon their HRV score? Uh, so uh, we haven't looked at this in the data, but actually it's something we, we are gonna look at soon because uh, we have introduced also some other features where you can look at training load and mm. you know chronic and acute and there is some ratios where you, mm, that are used um, in sports science to let's say determine um, when you are at higher risk because you are acute training. So what you are taking in the recent past with respect to what I used to take based on maybe uh, longer period in your recent past mm -hmm. is is too high. So if you you know if you double your training in the past week with respect to what you're used to take, then you are much higher risk of injury, right? Yeah. So since we measure also training load and people report their trainings, and some of them also report when they are injured, you're gonna look at uh, you know what's it is known that there is higher risk when when you're in these conditions. But what is not known is what does your physiology say? So we can also then maybe go a week back and see if there are changes in HRV or heart rate, which might be indicative of what happened, which would be great, of course, because then you could also use that information to mm -hmm. make uh, better choices and maybe reduce training load uh, yeah. before it's too late. That's awesome. Mm. Yeah, this is wonderful. You know, it's really personalizing training yeah. because I've worked with a coach before in, in both strength and on the bike, on mm -hmm. cycling. And it's really kind of a generic spreadsheet based upon your power output for yeah. a given test. Mm -hmm. Whether that's power output wattage on a, on a bike mm -hmm. or a, a run for a runner mm -hmm. or just you know some one rep max in the context of weightlifting. Yeah. And so the, and like it's not very personalized, right? Mm -hmm. It's just like follow the spreadsheet and this periodization, but mm -hmm. I like how this real-time feedback. And so that kind of accounts for life load and stressors and alcohol use and travel and all the yeah. things that the spreadsheet is not smart enough to figure out. Yeah, yeah, so. I think so. And also I think also coaches and the community is starting to uh, introduce these tools more and more in their practice. So um, I think it's a, it's a nice time because we are learning a lot of this process mm -hmm. uh, as we try to make the tools more useful to them 
and they try to learn how to use them and you know we work together to make it more practical and easier and more effective. Mm. That's fantastic. So Marco, as we kind of wrap up here, you talked a lot about some of the new things that you're launching and new integrations. Mm -hmm. um, first thing that comes to mind is, you know, there, there is integration with the Polar Bluetooth mm -hmm. chest strap. Is that worth it for someone that really wants to fine tune or is the finger going to work? So the, um, the technology is as accurate as we validated it uh, against uh, full ECG, so you know, that electrocardiogram and we measure the ECG, the PPG from the camera and the polar at the same time mm -hmm. and obtain the same results. Mm -hmm. At the same time, uh, it, it is definitely true that it takes some time to familiarize with the measure. So I would say everyone should like practice a bit and make sure that they understand, you know, what a good PPG looks like and so. And then there is also some maybe more borderline cases where uh, it doesn't work that well because you might have low perfusion mm -hmm. or other situations. So. Yeah, I think in certain cases it's definitely worth to grab a polar, yeah. uh, but um, it's not about accuracy, it's just more about uh, yourself finding the right setup that uh, works for you so that you can always get high quality data. Mm -hmm. and the app is able to tell you how good is your data, so if it is reported as optimal then there is no problem. Right. Um, otherwise yeah, you might want to uh, look at uh, getting a sensor. Uh, one of the other good reasons might be if you want to measure for longer. Like That's it's, it's hard to stay like five minutes with holding the, it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah. <laughs> so then in that case, uh, I would also get a polar. Mm. But uh, yeah, I think five minutes sounds like a lot of time for most people. Yeah. So in that case, then you you can just uh, Still have the phone. There. Yeah, especially the you know wearing the sensor in the morning, and you have to also uh, get it you know humid because otherwise it will not. Uh, measure correctly if ah. you take a polar so mm -hmm. then there is a lot of extra that is I think why people don't do that yeah especially our users of course it's like I, th I think more than 90% uh, just uses the camera mm -hmm. that's yeah I, th I was thinking about doing it longer and so I thought mm -hmm. that because um, sometimes lying there you're trying to really be calm because you don't want to induce a stress right but yeah. But I thought just for curiosity's sake, you know, yeah. go for five minutes. So I was going to order the strap. And, and yeah, in that case, a uh, I would order, yeah. No, maybe a, a polar strap, which is what we validated many times and is super accurate. That's yeah. fantastic. So as we kind of finish up here, anything about heart rate variability testing or the HRV4 training app that we didn't get to chat about that you want to share with our audience? I think, uh, bad. that's a good overview of, you know, how to use it and what to get out of it. And, uh, yeah, what we try to do now is um, mm -hmm. basically to keep working on uh, making the tool, you know, easy, um, get it to many people so that we can use the data to then understand better some of these relations, which are, again, quite complex and affected by many parameters. But you know, the more people report all the different conditions and situations, and the more we can stratify by different characteristics, and the more then we can personalize the apps that it's really useful for um, different subsets of people, and not only you know um, athletes or uh, the subjects of uh, clinical studies that were done in the past. That's fantastic. So we have a lot of nutritionists and you know, fitness professionals and, and doctors that tune into the show. I know Alessandro was uh, our mutual friend again. Who, mm -hmm. He's like a coach, right? And so yeah. can people sign up to be a coach? Can anyone sign up to be a coach? Yeah. And then how many users can they kind of track mm -hmm. and monitor? So we have indeed this uh, coach platform which works um, on iPads and iPhones. So the idea is that if you have the app, you can also have the coach the coach app and use it even on the same phone. Mm. Um, and you can, yeah, you can monitor up to 100 athletes at the same time right mm -hmm. now. Uh, or clients and indeed then you would get your the data from them um, right after the measure so they, the the client doesn't have to do anything in particular yeah. uh, you just take your measurement and it's sent to the servers and after your your clients authorized you to access you can simply get the data up there uh, and we offer there some other uh, visualizations which also help understanding better what are like normal deviations and when things are not normal and what are the parameters were reported and mm -hmm. trying to figure out better how you can make use of this data uh, in an effective way. Yeah, that's neat. So I'll, mm -hmm. I'll get a text from Alessandro like, you should train hard today or you should take it easy. I <laughs> he's think monitoring you. Yeah, he's okay, checking cool. it out. He's on it, you know, so good. that's really cool. Well, Marco, it's great to catch up with you. Thank Thanks you. for all that Thank you, you do. Thank you so much. So mm -hmm. the website is hrv4training.com. Yeah, exactly. That's where we have all the resources, especially on the blog. Uh, we try to 
blog often about what we do with the data and uh, you know try to explain things and be transparent on many aspects of this process. That's yeah. awesome. Thanks for doing the, the creating the app and, and sharing all this Thank information. You. It's been wonderful. Thank really you. Really appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you.